Anyways, uh, we're going to switch to a new lecture. This is, this is the first time the lecture series has been given. It used to be understanding practical chess, but they are like, Josh, you don't actually understand practical chess. We can't have you teach this course. So they changed it. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Obviously, it wasn't because of me. Uh, they just wanted to mix things up. So it's now called Double X Clam, which is basically games that feature... I don't know why I keep doing this. Uh, games that feature um, Double X Clam moves. So I usually would pick games of like top players or from the past. I actually decided that I would choose a few of my own games. You don't often get to play double X clam moves, at least in my experience. Uh, you can give these moves generously, like double X clam. Like what does it mean, right? Like an exclamation mark move is a move that's clearly best and is best is like difficult a little bit, right? Like best for a very particular reason. Uh, like when you need a very decisive move, double X clam. I feel like Chess definitions are not clear all the time, but I would say that double X clam means that there's like a little bit of inspiration behind it, like really unexpected. So a move that is not only very, very strong, but maybe and strongest, but also there's a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of like, wow, where'd that move come from? So that's how I see double X clam moves and that's kind of how I'm treating it. So I, I haven't played that many, at least that I would label that in my career. Um, so I decided I'd show a few. <laughs> uh, so let me go to my study here. All right. So, uh, let me go toward this position. Uh, I don't know. I would say double X clam moves would have to be the best move in the position. Like if it's not the best move, I wouldn't give a double X clam. Everyone's different. I would say people annotate differently. For example, if you read a Nun Endgame book, which I'd recommend, they're very difficult, but they're really precise. Like John Nunn will say that, like most people don't do it this way, but for me, exclam means a move that is an only move, like to only move to, ke to, to get that result. So for example, if you're up a pawn in a Rook Endgame, an exclam move may be the only move that wins. So that's what he would give an exclam. I'm not quite so strict, but I would say that X clams in general, I would give only for, um, I would give X clams only for like clearly good moves that are like, like important and double X clam. I'd say like, there's an element of either something that's beautiful about it or unexpected things like this. So I'm going to actually show you two different examples, um, three technically, but so this was actually in 2005. I played this game 16 years ago now. Wow, that's actually crazy to think about. It's almost 17 years. This game was played almost 17 years ago at the Foxwoods Open in Connecticut at the casino. I was black against Ilya Schneider. Oh my goodness, it wasn't Ilya Schneider. It was Igor Schneider. How did I do that? Igor Schneider, uh, who was at the time, he was an FM. And I think I was an IM at the time. Something like this. Anyways, uh, or maybe even FM. Uh, so, yeah, definitely the chess.com algorithm. And again, it's really cool that they can design an algorithm at all. So I'm not really saying it's bad, but definitely a lot of those double X clams are very dubious. <laughs> like, not that it's not the best move, but that why would you give this move a double X clam? So we all have this. Anyway, this I actually got to play this move uh, in a tournament, and I was very, very happy with it. So I wanted to give you guys... Uh, a couple, like, just double X clan moves I was able to play, and then one game, which I think contains a double X clan move, but also just to show how spectacular things work, kind of. So, uh, black to play. Find the double X clan move. Something fell. That was good. Uh, it was d6, uh, and they... So again, I'm looking at the chat for some answers. Uh, again, I mean, it's kind of good. And I would say that this position, what's really funny is originally I was just going to play rookie 6 and just double rooks and say, well, your bishop's on a2 and my position's dominating, like, you know, why do I have to do anything special? But when you see a move like this, you kind of have to play it.
And I would say it's finding the move is one part of the challenge, but the second part of the challenge is calculating the whole line to get a winning position. Well, B4, I would be inclined not to play unless I'm sure, because like right now my pawns do a beautiful job of keeping this bishop out of play, so I don't really want to let the bishop get into the game. So people have mentioned knight d1 is a funny candidate. It's definitely a very beautiful move. But what are the what's the continuation after knight d1? What's like the best continuation? There's a bit more to it. My name is Buffalo. So you guys have the idea, like, what, what that move does. But what about a variation? Like, what's a precise variation? Because I would say that it's easy sometimes to spot a spectacular move. Not easy, but sometimes you spot it. But the key is, like, what happens afterwards? Like, how do you find, like, how do you calculate the clear win? And I'd say that's the most important part. There have been probably far more failed spectacular moves than successful ones. So part of it is, like, again, I saw this move pretty quickly, but I thought a long time before I played it because I wanted to make sure it was best in winning. Very good, honey. Knight d1 is indeed the move. Very nice, those of you who spotted it. So first the idea, very spectacular. Queen c5, rook takes e1 check, and knight f2 mate. Not, not a mating pattern you see every day, but a very, very cool smothered mate. And even nicer is after rook takes e1, rook takes e8, this doesn't even help white. Because after queen takes c5, check, and that's mate. Down a whole queen, but that's checkmate. So to me, that's like a pretty cool tactic. But you're not done. After rook takes e8, rook takes e8, white can play the move queen f1. And what's really funny is after knight f2 check, king g1, there's no really great discovered check. I could take this pawn on b2, I suppose, but that doesn't look so special. So if I don't have anything great here, this isn't so wonderful, right? Like, it's great to be able to play knight d1, and you feel good with yourself, but if after queen f1, you don't have a win, you're like, hmm. <laughs> but the question is, what is black's win after queen f1? <laughs> Taking the b2 pawn is probably good enough, but uh, I don't know. I mean, probably it's, probably it's fine, right? Like, you probably win that position, but... I think there's a bit better. Very good. Rookie one. So pinning the queen to the king, they must take a non-net of two check. So of course queen takes f2 is possible, giving up the queen. He played this, I played knight d3 check, hitting the king and the queen. And this position, after takes, takes, I think I played king f8 or g6 or something, and after this, it's very, very easy to, to claim victory because the bishop is still out of the game, and in the meantime, I'm just going to move around and start taking stuff. So he really doesn't have a, ch a chance to, you know, to, to save this game. So overall, kind of a cool tactic, but knight one I would say, is an example of a really spectacular move. So I'm actually going to give you one that's slightly easier. Um, but it's one which I would definitely call a double exclamation move, and I'll tell you why. So this was a game I played at the Moscow Open in 2008 against Gumar Mois Moiseev. This tournament was brutal, guys. Like, it's kind of like, like now you, you play in tournaments and everyone seems underrated. When I played in Moscow, there were several really strong players, but even the players who were lower rated than me were so good. Um, I mean, I think... I had this 2300 kid grind me down in some technical endgame with like perfect technique. And it's like, wow, it's just a different world. Uh, but overall, my tournament was kind of so-so. Not great. I, you know, b about broke even on rating, something like that. Maybe lost a little bit. But this last game was fun to play. So 
I actually had a choice earlier about whether to trade the rooks, and trading the rooks would have won, but I felt like it was messy. And I calculated this very, very long variation, and it ended up in this position. So my opponent, who was in slight time trouble, thought I blundered. He played rook g2 check and took, defending the pawn on g7 from mate. Um, but yeah, I, I can tell a couple of you see it already. But at the end, he kind of missed what you call like a... I forget who told me this. It's the stinger at the end of the tail, right? Like you're looking at a scorpion's tail and then uh, the stinger at the end. And the whole point is that you see a whole variation except the last move and the last move changes the whole position. Because it looks like I blundered horribly. I'm up a piece still, but black has tons of counterplay. Yes, queen takes g7 check. Very, very cool move to be able to play. Knight f6 check. And what's really, what I love about this position, I actually showed this to a kid's... Uh, group who I was showing checkmates to earlier today. What I love about this position is that this rook is essential. If this rook weren't here, black would just be winning after king g7. But because after king h8 rook check, this rook is actually in the way. <laughs> so it has to block on the worst square possible and allow mate. So queen takes g7 check was a very, very cool move to be able to play. And this was actually the last round of the tournament. So I got to finish the tournament on a high note, even though on the whole it was not so great. Um... Luckily, I was able to play better in Aeroflot Open, which took place right after. Um, nothing spectacular, but I had a pretty solid tournament. I felt like I broke even on rating in Russia, and I felt like I had to play well to do that. Like, the players are just very strong. Um, I remember I played one kid, and he was rated 2200, and I won, but it was tough. And then I saw he was a GM, like, less than two years later or something. <laughs> I was like, wow. It's, uh, they're a lot better than I was at that time, let me put it that way. Um, but anyway, it, it was a cool experience. Uh, so the next one, I'm going to actually show you a whole game. So this one, uh, in this game, I am black. Let me just actually check something here. All right, great. Just want to make sure it's not showing the notes. Uh, this one, I was black uh, against Ruben Felgaer, who's an Argentinian GM. This game was played in 2011, uh, I believe, at the... Continental Championships, this took place in Mexico. It was the second to last round, so we were both kind of towards the leaders, so if whoever won this game would have a good shot to qualify for the World Cup. So it was a really, really important game. And this game, I wanted to show because I wanted to show one way, like sometimes spectacular moves come when you're crushing your opponent, you find some double X clan move. But I would say a lot of the really... A lot of the double X clan moves that come about actually come out of necessity. And I'll show you why. So I'm going to breeze through the opening. It was a Lopez. I decided to play Marshall, which I don't didn't usually play, but I prepared very specifically. So he plays bishop e3. This is all pretty standard. Takes, takes, knight a5. I play knight c4 and c5. He plays b3, knight b6. Again, this is all relatively normal. Knight fd7. Knight bd2, rook c... Oy, why, Josh, do you do this? Rook c8, queen b1. The game fast-forwarded real fast. And he played this move queen b1 and it stood up from the board, and this move shocked me. Uh, I remember that. Thinking, what are you doing? Like, this <laughs> this unpinning maneuver looks very strange. But it does make sense. The, the pin's annoying, and he wants to try to get his pieces out. So I thought a long time here, and I came up with maybe the worst possible solution on how to play the position. Um, so I want you guys to all to, to find an, a way to play for black, and I almost guarantee you'll play it better than I did. I found maybe the worst possible idea. <laughs> and it's, it's bad because I think strategically it was a bit dubious, but I also think that tactically it is also bad. So just find any good idea for black and you'll be fine. <laughs> No, this puzzle is more just getting you into the game. Like, you, you, you're you faced with this queen b1 move, how would you react to it? I would say it's a bit clever, though, because I would love to play... Like, I would love... Normally, they, they do stuff like this with a bishop here, and then I, I can at least put my bishop on g6 to kind of dull this bishop on c2. So c4 would be a perfectly good move here. Probably the best move. Uh, the idea is you're threatening c3, so they take... So in the game, I didn't like this, because after bc4, bishop c3, my position's very cramped and not so good. But I can take with the knight, and taking with the knight's pretty strong, actually. So, allowing these two pawns in the center is sometimes dubious, but here, I have some pressure on these knights, I have activity, I think I'd be doing okay, overall. 
So c4 would be a good move. Um, c takes d4 I didn't love because after knight takes, my bishop's not great. Still better than what I played. <laughs> and even bishop h5 here, just a tempo down, trying to play bishop g6 is perfectly fine. Um, it's not perfect. Like, it, definitely white has some advantage after bishop h5, but it's it's fine. So I came up with, I thought a long time and came up with a strategic concept here. My concept was that after bishop takes knight, pawn takes, pawn takes d4. Uh, the whole idea is that after he captures, I was going to play g6 and basically play against this bishop. I get rid of my own bishop, which I thought was dead weight. And now I'm going to play against the c2 bishop. So the question is, what is the flaw to my logic? What did What move did he drop down on me here? Very good. e5 is a very strong move. After knight takes d4, g6, even here I'm probably worse, but at least my idea would make some sense, because I'm trying to take the dark squares and make this bishop not so good. I guess he can still play rook e2, queen e1, bring his other rook out, and he's still probably better, but at least it's playable for me. But he drops down e5. And now I realize that, wait a second, something has gone very, very wrong this isn't supposed to happen. I, I can take this pawn, right? But now after bishop h7 check, knight takes e5, all of a sudden my king is just wide open, and I realized this was awful for me. So I played the move g6. The question is, what move does he drop down on me now? And again, I would give this up, this move also an exclam by him. No double exclams left. We'll get to that in a bit. Very good, e6. Again. And now it's like, oh no. And I, I was like at the board just kind of like this going, am I just going to, it's going to be like, this is a crucial game in this tournament and I'm just going to lose like a potser. Uh, I'm going to get crushed by him. He's going to get a brilliancy prize. They're going to award it. He'll be standing up there with his brilliancy prize. Give a great speech. I was having nightmares. Um... Now, I, I wasn't actually thinking all that at the time, but I was definitely like, I definitely realized something had gone wrong. I was very, very nervous here. But I did the only thing I could do. I played pawn takes pawn. I thought that that was the best try. At least make him prove what he has. And it also gives him a choice. And I saw a glimmer of hope because I, I had a slight inspiration as to what my idea would be here, but it was very vague. But I definitely had a hope. So he has two moves, both of which look absolutely crushing. Bishop takes g6 and knight takes d4. The question is, which one would you guys play, and which one do you think is better? And any reasons, right? Like, you can say the move if you want, but if you give a variation or reasons behind it, it's even better. So what do you guys think? <laughs> well, I don't think he wants to secure a draw. I think he wants to destroy me. So I wouldn't worry about that. So we got a, a lot of bishop g6, people. Uh, I don't know what exchange size, uh, sacrifice you're talking about. After an 84, like rook c2 is probably not great. <laughs> Keep in mind, he's a GM himself. I think he was rated about 50 points higher than me in white, so I don't think drawing me is something he would take great pride in, but we were relatively close in rating, like not that far apart, but... And keep in mind, a, a draw would leave us in a difficult position. A win would put us in a position where we really, like, had, you know, chances to, to do something in the tournament. So, bishop takes g6 would indeed be winning here. I would even give this move maybe two x clams, although it's expected. It's kind of like the most natural move, so maybe not. But this move would be crushing. First of all, if I take, he simply takes, and rook takes e6. And my king is just completely trashed. The, the d4 pawn's falling next. He's threatening mate in a million different ways. This is not good. So, I wasn't really considering taking it. Uh, there were two moves I was considering. One was e5. And here, takes h7, king h8, there's one key kind of idea here. 
uh, which is very important. So how would you try to beat me here as white? Because this was one defense I was considering. It doesn't work, but it was one I was considering. So knight g5, I think I can take that. Uh, rook e4 is definitely possible. Um, again, though, I don't have to take the bishop, so I might... And you're not threatening rook h4, so I might have an opportunity to play like knight d5, getting my knight in. I don't know. It's definitely a, a, a very interesting move, though. Knight d4 is possible. Uh, I don't see the mate, though, after I take it. Like, if takes, I can play bishop f6, maybe. I don't know if I'm getting mated. Maybe I am, but... So queen g6 is kind of what I would count on here. So there is something very cool. Uh, the question, Actually, this is a good question. What is the best move for black here? Let me just make sure I remember this right. Yeah, so knight f6 uh, looks very nice, but there's a big problem with it, actually. So queen e8 allows queen... Uh, if you play queen e8, I can play queen h6, and this is going to be crushing, yeah? So knight f6. Uh, rook g8... Um, ah, so here rook g8... I think still here is good. Maybe? Uh, I could also take this rook. I, I, I think is also probably very strong. Uh, so knight f6, though, what is the issue? It's actually quite nice. So knight g5, I don't know if it works. Let me check this out, actually. Maybe here I can play this move with the idea of queen h6, knight g4. And if queen ba... Uh, yeah, and then I can take this knight. Yeah, this might work. Because I'm hitting your queen, you don't have time for anything. So knight g5 I think doesn't quite work. The, the key is actually this move knight takes d4. Because now if pawn takes d4, bishop takes d4, the problem is... I'm just getting made it every which way because this pin. So, for example, if here, you can even play something like this. And if rook takes, then mate, yeah? Stupid pin, right? So, this would be terrible. So, I'd have to try knight takes h7 and then knight e6. So, threatening mate and the queen. I have to try this, hitting his queen. And then, I forget where the queen goes. If it's f7 or h6. Let me see. Ah, yeah, h6 is the move. And then the whole idea is the rook takes pawn is coming too, <laughs> potentially. So, for example, the queen probably has to go, like, say, queen e8, for example. Rook takes e5 is just completely crushing. Something like this. So, I guess, oh, there's still bishop f8. I forgot about this move. I'm cheating a little bit, but... Yeah, but the problem is that even when you go for this, I kind of lose all my pawns, and this is not exactly a pleasant position. But yeah, bishop g8 is very neat. However, in this position, I can play the move rook takes f3 first... And now knight f6. And now because there's no sacrifice here, this is actually quite okay for black, I think. So queen g6 is what I was hoping for, but at some point I realized that after just bishop back, I'm basically dead. <laughs> because 
he's just coming in with all these resources and like my pieces are tied up and he can sack at some point like my pawns are not going to hold in the center so just bringing the bishop back rather than queen d6 is just very strong sometimes the simple moves are very good uh i was considering rook takes f3 might be the best move but even here after check and takes it's not so great i can play bishop f6 for instance rook takes e6 knight f8 so i have to give a little bit of material back but this kind of position is just really not good. Uh, the two bishops are monstrous here, and my king is wide open. Like, king h1, queen h3, rook g1, this is just going to be very, very sad. So bishop takes g6 would have been absolutely crushing, and he probably would have destroyed me if he played this move. But I think he actually thought that he had no need to even do that. I think he thought knight takes d4, he's threatening knight takes e6, he's threatening bishop takes g6, my whole position's in ruins, and it's simple. Like, what is he going to miss, right? And this is where I'd say a lot of, like, brilliancies, you can call them. I wouldn't even call them that. But, like, really, like, spectacular ideas are born. It's born out of necessity. I'm getting destroyed. So I need a way to not get destroyed here. <laughs> so I looked, I looked at every kind of random tempo move I could. I looked for all sorts of crazy ideas, and I found a crazy idea. Um, so again, rook takes c2 looks nice, but it doesn't really solve any problems, right? Like, rook takes c2, I think he just takes, and knight e6 is still coming. Like, I'm I'm still getting killed. That's kind of the problem. So rook takes c2 doesn't solve enough problems. So the, the double x clan move, that I would call it at least, doesn't come for a few moves, but I kind of saw it at this point. So you're very close, uh, Plo Crow. So... Bishop h4 is how it starts. So at first this move looks kind of silly, but the idea is that bishop takes f2 is not so great if you allow it. So for example, if knight takes e6, bishop f2, king here, bishop e1, and this is a key idea, I cover, I threaten mate. <laughs> so they have to take the bishop, and then queen e7, and I'm pinning this guy, I'm threatening this bishop. Uh, I'm actually doing very well. So knight takes e6 would be very bad. Rook takes e6. Is interesting, but after bishop takes f2, I can take this knight, play queen here, hitting the bishop. I'm kind of surviving. Uh, it's not so easy, but... Uh, and bishop takes g6 is also very promising, but after check, e5, I'm, again, I, I kind of am living. If knight e6, I go here, I sack the exchange. I actually think this is, like, plenty of chances for me. So he plays, though, the obvious move, which is g3. <laughs> And here, it's kind of like, well, Josh, what exactly have you accomplished? <laughs> you just put a bishop on a hanging square. But I promise you, I had an idea. So one of you mentioned queen f6. This move is actually uh, often like a decent idea, trying to hit f2. The problem is that often this move f4 is really annoying. So there's a very, very similar line to this. Like, yeah, here f4, I think, is the big problem. And there's just no way to, to deal with this. Like, if e5, I just go back, and I'm just going to take your bishop. It's kind of sad, actually. So queen f6 would be nice. e5 is possible, but then after knight e6, queen f6, I take your rook. So, like, if here, um, knight e6, if queen f6, I think, yeah, I take your rook. And I think I can just defend this guy now, right? But maybe f4 is still a decent move. I don't know. But like something like rookie 2, I don't really see where my compensation is. Oh, we have it. So this is where the double x clan move comes in. I have my rook, my queen, and my bishop hanging. And one of the nice things when you have a lot of pieces hanging is that you don't actually have to defend them all the time because they can only take one piece at a time. So I say, have my most valuable piece. So rook takes f2, I'd give a double x climb. First of all, it's definitely clearly the best move in my only chance. But part of it also was I had to kind of see this back when, because in this position, if I don't have rook takes f2, I'm just dead. So not only is it best, but it's probably the only idea. It's not enough to necessarily save the game. Like, I think white's still better if they play very accurately. But it's by far the best try and definitely um, a decent idea. Uh, and it's, again, I would say it has the extra x clam for being spectacular. Not only is it a queen sack, but it just seems to come out of nowhere. 
Um, but again, keep in mind, this wasn't born out of, well, I'm crushing my opponent, let me sack some stuff. It's like, well, I'm desperate, and I either do this or resign or give up all my pieces, right? So it's like, sometimes you just have to find great moves or you just lose. And I would say that here I managed to find this resource, but another day, who knows, right? Uh, and it definitely makes things very, very complicated. Um, and it was one of those moves where he was thinking a very long time and you could tell like there were people passing by the board and just looking at it like, wait, what is going on? <laughs> so my opponent actually plays it very accurately at first. And I would say that this is to his credit. It's very easy to freak out when you see a move like Rook takes F2. It comes out of nowhere and like what's going on. But, you know, the really good players, even if they're faced with moves like this, will come up with good moves. So first of all. If he tries to decline the queen sack and take my rook, I can simply play queen f6 check. And here, I think it's just a draw with best play. I take the knight, he probably has to take my bishop, and I just keep checking him. And this is, even he's up a rook, but he can't ever cross the f-file due to rook f1 check. So this is simply a draw. Um, so his only try is to take the queen. I take on c2, and here, once again, he finds the best continuation for white. So what would you guys try to do as white here? I'm actually kind of curious. It's not easy facing the two rooks, but you can see my idea, right? I sacrificed a queen. I'm down currently a queen for a piece. That's not very much. But my two rooks on the seventh are so strong that they actually compensate for a queen almost fully. I'm also trying to take advantage of this queen being stuck on b1. If any of these things weren't true, it would be... Um, it, would be in, it would be not so great. So bishop d4 is actually the move which... I thought was the best try during the game. Um, but it turns out I'm actually okay after this. <laughs> uh, so yeah, of course, if he wants to, he can simply play pawn takes bishop and we just draw... Oh, not like that. That would be checkmate. <laughs> and we would probably just draw, right? Like here, takes, here, and, you know. There are lots of ways why I can draw. That's not really the issue, right? Um, so queen takes c2 is what he played. I think that's the best move. This is what worried me during the game. So here, I think the most accurate way to play is rook g2 check. So first of all, if he goes to h1, I take, and now I can actually just take this knight, and believe it or not, the two pieces are better than the queen here. Like, the rooks are so powerful, and I have lots of pawns, and my pieces are coming in. Like, there's no way white can ever think of winning this game. In fact, white's in trouble, I think. So he must go to f1, and you'll see why I put the king there uh, in a bit later. Takes here. So one of the keys here is that if they try to sack now, my pawn structure is worse, but I have this move knight d5, and now knight e3 check is going to be very nasty. And that's why I want the king on f1. Without With the king on g1, knight d5 is far less strong. So that's kind of the whole point. So rook e8 check is the best move. King g7 takes here. And now, after check, white should probably just draw. Just take this draw. Because if they try to go to e1... Black has a very, very strong move. Any guesses? Knight e5, very nice. Yeah, so here they have actually only one way to, to try to play here. So um, I think rook e7 check is the best move. If they try rook takes e5, then simply takes. And if check, I just go back. And here, they're actually just in trouble, because rook takes h6 is just going to end up in mate, and if they try to sack their queen, I have too much material now. So this position, I think, is simply bad. Um, again, it's not like, you know, white resigns right away, but overall, like, the pieces are just so much stronger. So I don't think that works out. Uh, what else is there? Yeah, there's queen takes c2, but now I can simply take, and after rook e7 check, I can move up. And I think this position is also kind of dead. So, for example, if he tries to check me and take the pawn, just for instance, uh, I'm pretty sure... What's the way to, to win here? Um, oh, yeah, I think it's like this, right? So here, if king f3, one of the things I can do is do this and then come up, and I think I have this idea. So if takes, I go here, and I'm actually just delivering mates. Something like this. Um, or sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. I just take here, and then there's this stuff. Yeah, yeah, this is very strong. 
Uh, very similar actually to one of the other lines. Um, so the best try is actually rook e7 check. Because now I can't really come up because then if check king f5, like I'm pinned, and that's a big problem. So I have to go back. And now white has a spectacular way to try to hold. Takes, takes. And white only has one move, really, to try to hold this. And I'll give you a hint. It has to do with having the king on f8. Because if you give black extra moves, like if you if you play rook here, for example, and I play knight d5, you're basically dead. Because these knights are going to come in and they're going to checkmate you. Like, these knights are deadly. So you have to play exactly... Oops. Uh, where am I? Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, king e1, knight e5, rook e7 check. Takes, takes, rook c7. And the idea is that I can't take the rook because of knight e6 check. That's why the king is important. So I take here, and now they go for this. Knight e6 check. So if I do this, they just draw. And so I don't want to draw here. They do this. I give my king a little escape square. I take the rook. And probably I have good winning chances here is what I would call it. I'm up a lot of pawns. It's not so simple to win because white's so active here. But probably I'm the one with chances. So to simplify this for you, they really should take a draw if they go for this. But I didn't see all this during the game, as you would imagine. It's not so easy to see. So bishop d4 was the move I was scared of. But it turns out he actually played the best move. He took... And took the bishop. Very simple. Rook b2. And he plays rook a d1. Also best. d5. I have to push my pawns. Knight, e, knight c6 e4. And this is kind of where things get absolutely crazy. Um, he has a couple different tries. He played the move a4. Which is actually quite logical. Trying to trade off some pawns and liquidate a little bit. But after that I think I'm doing okay. Um... So the basic deal is I have two pawns for the exchange. His pawn structure on the king side is not great, which helps me. But I also have loose pawns for the moment, and his rooks are quite good. And I have to be careful the game doesn't simplify too much, which would help him. So the question is, what would you try here for white? He has a couple different tries, uh, apart from a4, which is what he played. So a 97 check for sure is one of the tries. So king g7, knight takes d5. But here, black has a very, very nice move. Well, rook c2, I don't want to allow the trades, right? Knight e5, very nice. So the idea is if he tries to take my my knight, there's knight check, and this is a draw. If he ever goes to h1, I made him with rook h2. So this is a known uh, drawing technique, uh, drawing motif. So he should not take, but he does have a very, very nice way to try to continue. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh... So rook f1 is possible, but I think the issue with it is I can take this knight and then play check, and he actually has to sack his rook, and this is not good for him. Probably losing the rook endgame. So the best move is actually king f1. And now the question is, how do I play as black? Once again, not so simple. So Plavkara, that's one idea. Yeah, knight takes d5 doesn't really work out. 
Because after rook d5, knight f3, you can simply play rook e2. This is kind of the issue. And there's no perpetual with the knight anymore. The rooks, if the rooks trade, it's very bad. Uh, if knight f3, uh, I believe it's the same thing. Just rook e2 is a big problem. And it's even worse, because if takes here, I think I just take this knight. And then take here. That's an extra piece. Even this is maybe not so simple you take, but I don't know. I feel like white's going to win this A-pawn maybe. Like, this is going to be an extra piece that's better than the pawns. But even this is maybe not super simple. Um, knight d3 is indeed the best try. So rook takes e4 is the move. If they try to take here... Um, let me see, what's the deal? After takes, I think... Yeah, I take... And I think it's just too many pawns now, because I can take this pawn and then take this pawn. That's a lot of pawns, and uh, I think it's just too liquidated. Like, you're just not going to be able to win with so few pawns on the board. Something like this. Um, so that's kind of the issue there. So knight d3, rook takes e4 is the best try, but then knight f2. Rook e7 check, king f8. So everything's kind of hanging. <laughs> it's a funny position. But white still has a good try here. What do you think white's good try is, anyone? So rook d1, I think I can play knight takes knight. And this is probably good for me. Uh, rook e2, I can take your rook, I think. Defending my own rook. And my knight doesn't quite get trapped because you have to take the time to take... Also, I can... Oh, I can take your knight. <laughs> but even if I had to take your rook, I can get out with knight d3. And again, with these pawns, you're never going to be better, really. Um, so... Oh, this computer probably should be plugged in somehow. Figure that out. Uh, so yeah, there's another move for white here. Remember, your your rook's hanging, right? It's okay. It's a tough position, and we're not even no remotely towards the end. And once again, I'm not implying I saw all this. Like this is just like how crazy the variations get. So it's white's move, guys. White's move. Well, there's only so many safe squares for that rook, right? So the best one is rook d4. So you're basically playing against that knight. That knight feels a little foolish. So I take here. And then, that was most certainly not Ben Simon, but... Uh, yes. So rook e2. So... Forcing the rook off. King takes. And here, we have both knights hanging. But once again, knights are tricky pieces, guys. So one way to play is knight h3, and I think this probably is good enough. It's a little weird, though, playing this way, because I feel like our knights are not coordinated. Maybe they can try something. So knight e4 is what I looked at, which is even funnier. I want to centralize my knights. So the knights defend each other in a, like because of this fork, right? So either knight they take. This is a nice little tactic. If takes this knight, then takes. Um, so if they have to play something like king up and I just play knight back, I think black's doing very well with the two knights. Maybe the king comes up or something. Maybe up to the center. I don't know. But we're not done because they take here. Check. Takes, takes. And their king is a lot better than ours, even though their pawn structure is worse. So it turns out there's only one way to draw for black. Would you guys like to find it? At least I think so. Only one way to draw. And keep in mind, this is just the 97 check line. We haven't even gotten to the other line. 
So a5, I just play king d5 and just go after your pawns. Well, I wouldn't play b4 right away. I'd probably go, say, king d5, threatening king c6, and then after king d7, I'd play b4 and say, shut out your pawns, and uh, I don't think this is going to go super well. Because you can't keep my king out forever. Like, let's say you play h6, I can play h3. If you play here, I can play here. You eventually run out of moves, and then it's not so great. So, trying to play like that is going to be tough. Yes, Douglas, you have to play king g7. And there are lots of different nuances, but the basic idea is you get something like this. King runs, king up. b4, just to prevent b4 moves from black. Takes here. Takes, takes. g5. So you don't want to push the a pawn because then black queen's first. So you do this, and now the whole point is that you queen with check. And if you try something like this, you lose because takes, takes, a4. And this is not going to end well. We've seen this kind of thing before. And you can't get to g1. If king here, I play here. And you lose. So let us not do this. So you actually have to keep your king away, but the advantage is you can cross the g-file. Because here, if I try to take this queen, then I'm in time, right? Here, a4, my queen after you do. So you take the pawn, but the king is way too open, the a-pawn's vulnerable. There's no way, like, obviously you can try as white, but you're going to get checked to death here. The a-pawn's too vulnerable, the queen on h7's too out of play. You can blunder, right? If you do something like this and play queen check and I go here, then it's like, oh shoot. <laughs> but... As long as you check diagonally and don't allow the queen blocks, it's an easy draw. Because the a-pawns to lose. So that doesn't work out. The other line is a different move. So instead of knight e7 check, and instead of a4, which is what was played, um, what else can white do? This is a very clever move, which I, I, I looked at during the game a little, and maybe fear, I feared the most, but I didn't realize how good it was. Although even there, it turns out I have more chances than I thought. <laughs> I would say, though, that this move is the best try to win for white. So see what you guys can do. I, again, I wouldn't give it a double X clam, but I'd give it a single X clam. Knight b4, I think, is a bit too passive. It allows knight e5. Knight e5 is a very powerful move, which really secures uh, at least a draw for me most of the time. So I would say not knight b4. Taekwondo, that seemed to come out of nowhere. Oops, why do I keep doing this? And uh, I'm not a martial arts kind of guy myself. That's what you were asking. Yeah, a4 is what was played. Um, it turns out the best try here for white is rook f1. And the basic idea is that I have nothing better really than taking this pawn. And then he plays knight e7 check and goes for this. And again, like if I try to take and take, this knight is just really terrible. So for example, if knight f6, he plays here. And one sad line is if I try to activate my knight, he checks me. If king back to g8, for example, here and rook c8 is crushing... So I have to go up and then here. And my knight actually blocks me. So if king h5 he takes, I have to block with the knight, which of course is awful. Um, and here I'm actually lost. Wow, a lot of questions that are very random. I am 35. Wow, I'm 35. That's crazy. All right. So, um, so the better move for black here is knight e5. So I pitch this piece. Check on f3, they sack. But it turns out this position is not so easy to win, uh, I don't believe. Because, again, this knight on b6 is a bit out of play. I have lots of pawns. The double h pawns don't really make life easy for white. I still think white has some okay chances. They play rook here, so they win the f pawn. But I give a check, I go back, 
and then I come up the board and I kind of take these pawns. White well, can play knight d5 and b4 and have some chances, but I think that it's going to be very difficult with all the pawns liquidating so fast to, to win as white. Uh, so I would say that black has good drawing chances, but definitely white still has chances to win as well. So this would have been the best. So as you can see, my whole rook takes f2 um, brilliancy or whatever you want to call it was maybe good enough to draw or I'm still worse, but at least it presents problems in a position where I basically was getting crushed, right? And a lot of games I probably would just get crushed, but he, like, I found one kind of saving grace and that's maybe enough. But one thing I would say is that the position became harder to play for him. So even here, he's completely fine. Um, But after takes, takes, a5, it's just a tricky position for him to play because... He um like he wants to still win, right? He, he's still trying to win. But the more the game progresses, like if he doesn't do anything in the next five to ten moves and my king gets towards the center, he's gonna be the one in trouble. So he he again doesn't want to take because of knight e5, which is understandable. He plays rook f1. Um maybe he should have tried knight e7 check. Uh oops, and taking the pawn. But after knight e5 again, knight f3, I think that. Probably this should be enough to draw. I just have too... Like, he doesn't have enough pawns to try to win. But he shouldn't lose, for sure. He played rook f1. And rook f2. But here, I thought I had some decent chances. So, in the game, he actually had chances to draw, for sure. Um, but he played one in accuracy. And, and at this point, I think knight d8 was better. So he has knight f7 check as a possible resource. He played out to the edge of the board, which I thought looked wrong. Knight takes. And it turns out here he can still draw. Uh, but he has to find a very specific maneuver. So see if you guys can find it. This would not be at all obvious to me. I, he didn't find it either. Uh, but white apparently only has one way to try to draw here. Otherwise, he's in trouble. And this is what I mean. Like, this position, even if it's equal, if, if it's, like, white's fine, because the doubled pawns are so bad, because I have the connected passers, he's the one who has to play accurately, because... He's dealing, he's playing against the pawns. And I think playing against the pawns is harder than playing with them. There are some positions I'd say that are like this, where it's like, it's equal, but only one side can really blow it. <laughs> so rook b1 is what he played, which is very logical. <laughs> and one of the moves I expected, but it is not great. The problem with rook b1 is that I play knight e6, and now he can't stop me from doing this at some point. I can play here and go here, and he actually can't stop it. So that's kind of the issue here. So knight c4 check is possible, but I think I, I simply go to e6 and his knight has to just go back, which is not really great, and it allows me to make progress. So knight c4 check doesn't do it either. It turns out, and this is crazy to me, he has to play rook d4. The idea is now my knight can't move, so I have to move my other knight. If I try to go here, he can simply check me. So I have to move my other knight, and now rook b4. And I don't get ch the chance to put my knight on e6. So after here, he gives check, and this should be enough to draw. After something like takes, takes, I just don't quite have enough, because his king can come here. But again, this is really difficult stuff. Like, this is not at all easy. And I feel like, even, I think he was getting low on time, but even if he weren't, this would be very difficult to find. So, it was kind of a funny position, because definitely he was better for most of it, even after rook takes f2. But I felt like because he didn't do enough with a couple moves, his position became more difficult to play than mine. And here I was able to actually win pretty easily. So the game finished rook b8, knight c5. So I'm just wanting to play here. What's really funny is during in the official notation of the game, uh, they, they actually cut this game off early because they couldn't read notation. Apparently my handwriting's terrible or something. <laughs> or there was a mistake. Uh, but luckily I was able to save it. So yeah, here I actually could have played d4 check immediately because of this. And I probably should have. Because uh, of the check, so he can't take the pawn. Uh, but uh, I played h5, which is good enough. 
yes, I'd say that's a good way to put it. Like, I was in trouble most of the game. I found a really cool idea, and it kept me in the game. And because of that, especially because he was, of course, still trying to win, it made it so that it put him in some danger. And this position, I think, is just losing. The The knight and two pawns are just a lot better. And the fact that his pawn structure is terrible just makes it worse. Like, if his pawn structure were normal, I'd say he has some drawing chances, because he can try to get counterplay or liquidate some pawns. But here, the pawn structure just makes it impossible. So I was able to win pretty straightforwardly. You have to be careful. But a lot of it's tactics, right? So here I play the check, which looks at first weird. But the idea is that after king e2, I play check. And his rook's on a very unfortunate square. The knight's a difficult piece to play against. So he goes back, and then knight c5. I let him take the pawn. He doesn't really want it, because if he tries to take this pawn, I just push. And he's going to get queened on pretty fast. So rook c6 he played, knight d3. So I'm just trying to regroup. I'm trying to go here at some point, or maybe play king f3, knight here. So he comes up with the king. I play knight e5, so defending my pawn. Checks me and pins me. I play d3 check. And I have lots of ways to win. I decide to come around with my king. So I'm going to try to play king d2 on him. He plays rook e6. I play knight c4. Pins. And then one last little trick. I play king d4. The idea of doing this. King d2, rather. He goes behind. And then I play knight here with the idea of... Putting that on c2 and then pushing, and that was indeed all she wrote. And yeah, I mean, it was kind of nice to be able to... Insane in the endgame, no. Uh, the endgame was just the very end of what happened. The Most of the action took place earlier. Uh, and I could, I could talk a little bit more about the technique, but honestly, the technique, once the pawns start rolling, is just kind of easy, because you just slowly move your king and pawns up, and there's not too much he can do about it. But you saw how it went from being an endgame that was kind of okay to one that was troublesome just because of a couple slightly inaccurate moves. It really didn't take very much. Um, so yeah, I would say that it's always fun to look for double S glam moves. I'd say a lot of the examples in books and stuff like that are sacrifices to win, right? Like Kasparov's against Topalov, like his, his rook sack and all of this other stuff. There were so many spectacular moves in, in games like that. You guys, some of them may have seen them. Um, and I'd say that's what a lot of them are. But sometimes you get to play double escalate moves, not because you're crushing your opponent, but because you're getting killed. <laughs> because if you don't find a double exclam move, your position falls apart. And I would say that's less common, but sometimes it, it can be kind of nice because, you know, sometimes when your position's flowing, moves like that are spectacular occur to you more easily. But sometimes your position is horrible and you find a spectacular move to stay in it. It's a nice feeling, so... I definitely haven't gotten to play too many moves I would at least call double X clam in my career, but hopefully you enjoyed the examples I showed and you enjoy this class in the future. 